Hey, all. Hey, Eric. Uh, so we'll give it another minute or so, and then we can get started to see if anybody else comes in. And then, uh, Eric, you're going to start first. So if you want to make sure you can share your screen. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Geert Dant, and I'm uh, from John Jay. And we are here in this session, uh, which I put together mostly to have conversation between the six uh, authors of us. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, unfortunately, we are back on Zoom life. Um, so uh, this is a session called uh, about modern prison labor. And uh, we'll have uh, four interesting papers. And uh, the first one uh, Eric will present, and that's uh, and also from John Jay uh, about prison labor in the US state prisons. Uh, so Eric, if you would like to get started. Hey, thanks, Kier. Um, How's that? Folks can see just the slides. Awesome. Um, wonderful to be here with you all. I'm really excited about this, this forum. I've been an Irby fan for a long time and it's great to see you again, Andy and Anastasia and Hannah. It's been several months. Um, okay, so let's see. Just getting my screen fully set up. Okay, um, so today, we'll be presenting a working version of our study on prison labor, um, which we hope to put out soon, tentatively titled Prison Labor in U.S. State Prisons, 1974 to 2016, New Slavery or Enforced Idleness. We'll begin by establishing the theoretical context for our study and our research questions. We'll introduce the data source we analyzed, and then we'll share our findings, assess their theoretical implications, and then we'll look forward to questions and discussion after the paper presentations. Um, and there are slide numbers throughout, so feel free to take note of a slide number if you want to reference it during the discussion. Okay, so for theoretical context, there is a prevalent view in some academic discourse and in popular culture that understands mass incarceration as a new slavery, and specifically so as a racialized regime of labor exploitation updated to meet the sensibilities of the modern era. And here we're discussing labor exploitation in the Marxian sense as the appropriation of surplus value from a worker for a profiteering market exchange. Uh, the new slavery view is one that posits that an important force in the construction of mass incarceration was the desire of corporations to generate profits by instrumentalizing a racialized disposability in the United States to amass a captive labor force in a network of prisons. Uh, so in, in our view, this specific claim of mass carceral labor exploitation, as opposed to other potential forms of continuity with slavery, requires evidence in at least these three main categories. There's the content of the labor. So what type of work are prisoners doing and for whom? The scale, how many prisoners work and for how many hours? And wages, so if or how much prisoners are paid for their labor. Uh, there's of course much more to be examined with regards to labor exploitation, but we consider this to be sort of three initial areas of inquiry into the topic. Um, and in our paper, we examine the first two, the content and the scale. And we're lucky to have Andy with us today to share some findings about wages um, and Anastasia and Hannah to reflect on, on prison labor more broadly. Okay. So this is our mini lit review. Um, the content and scale of modern prison labor and particularly the scale are notably understudied, which is especially surprising, I think, given how much has been made of the legality of forced prison labor in assessments of mass incarceration. 
Uh, and as a result, it appears to us that many researchers who seek to reference these facts often end up making somewhat unsubstantiated claims that might further confuse the matter. Um, and in what is perhaps a main example, many cite a State Department of Corrections or the Federal Bureau of Prisons policy that might include something to the effect of requiring all able-bodied prisoners to work and then assume an incarceration that is characterized by constant compulsory labor without attending to first and foremost, the length of the work schedule that each assignment might carry, but also the portion of one sentence during which the requirement might apply, the types of prison programs that might count as work and surely other qualifying considerations. And to briefly illustrate the potential cost of neglecting these questions, we can take the example from some interviewing that we've done of someone incarcerated in a New York prison who has two hours of aggression replacement training in the morning, uh, which is you know what those programs are called, um, and a three hour mess hall cleanup work assignment in the afternoon that actually takes 15 minutes because there are 20 people assigned to it, and then unscheduled time in the evening. Uh, this able-bodied person would meet the so-called universal prison work requirement by spending over the course of a week, 10 hours in a prison therapy program uh, the merits of which are not the topic of our presentation, and an hour and 15 minutes doing manual labor. So not, not much time at all. And while we will turn to weekly hours work data later in the presentation to examine how common a story this might be, I mean to present this framing here only to show sort of conceptually how the question of the scale of prison labor is often inadequately addressed. And among popular sources, assertions of mass incarceration as mass labor exploitation are quite common. Here are a couple examples, um, one from Michael Moore and then one from Ava DuVernay's film 13th, the title of which is an important contribution to such a new slavery interpretation. Um, and there, there are empirical claims on both of these slides about how many prisoners work and for how many hours, what type of work they do and for whom. And we mean to test these popular ideas in our study. And just before moving on, I, I want to highlight some notable opponents of the new slavery view, including James Kilgore and Ruth Wilson Gilmore and the researchers at Prison Policy Initiative. Uh, we're hoping to build upon their work and offer further quantitative clarity to this debate. OK, so our study asks if mass incarceration is in fact a program of captive labor exploitation. And in order to ask that question, we break it down into three constituent questions that can be asked, I think quite straightforwardly of the data. So there's what type of work do prisoners do? Um, how many prisoners work and for how many hours? And how do these facts change over the course of the prison? Um, and in addressing the question of captive labor exploitation, we also hope to advance our broader inquiry, which is into the general economic functions that mass incarceration might serve within neoliberal capitalism, which we'll reflect on a little bit at the end. So the, the survey of prison inmates is the Bureau of Justice Statistics cross-sectional survey of prisoners in the US. It's meant to produce national representations in fields including demographic and socioeconomic characteristics, crime and sentencing history, drug and alcohol use. And there's a tiny section at the end on how one's time is spent during incarceration, which is uh, the section that we use. Um, <clears throat> we only look at state prisoners because it allows us to use all seven surveys um, since federal prisoners weren't included until the 90s. And about 90% of prisoners are incarcerated in state prisons. So we consider this to be a useful national representation. Okay, we'll turn first to our examination of the content of prison labor, for which we've developed the analytical categories of prison upkeep and enterprise, which we will use throughout the rest of our analysis. So we're beginning with that. Um, here's a little picture of the 1979 code book with the work assignment question, and it's about 10 type of work options which we'll continue considering uh, now. 
<clears throat> so we mean to organize our labor categories, primarily consider to consider the different economic contexts, so sources of demand, regula regulatory environments, et cetera, that determine the extent and content of the work assignments. So with this as our rubric, we use these two categories. There is prison upkeep, which is the domestic reproduction of prisons and prisoners, absent market exchange, and enterprise, uh, which we define as state-run or private commodity production. Um, and you can see on the slide how we map those categories onto the SPI options. Uh, yeah, and this is largely aligned with other, other categorizations um, that we've seen. Prison Policy Initiative has, I think, prison upkeep and industry, and a scholar named Asadar Bear talks about prison household production and commodity production. Those largely uh, map onto those exactly. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, there isn't any information from the survey on whether an enterprise job is done for a state-owned correctional industry or for a private corporation, um, which is a sad lack of data here, but it's probably not the best type of information to gather in such a survey anyway. But we can combine our findings here with some data that we've collected from some other sources um, on the extent of private enterprise prison labor, which we will return to in a minute. <clears throat> So to finish explaining our categories, while demand for enterprise labor derives from state agencies or private customers who are eligible, and in some cases required to purchase prisoner produced goods or services, prison upkeep labor is determined entirely by the internal planning processes of state corrections departments uh, for the day-to-day -day continuation of the institutions they govern. So in this sense, the prison is analogous to a household and prison upkeep work is analogous to domestic labor in that it is crucial reproductive work and often not directly organized by a purchasing market. And by their definitions, these categories are mutually exclusive and together they describe all prison labor. Um, you can see at the bottom, um, with regards to off grounds work, we assume that any assignment done off the prison grounds is facilitated to some extent by a state-owned correctional industry coordinating work release or other assignments that involve a non-Department of Corrections purchaser of prisoner products or labor. Um, so these work assignments involve some type of some type of exchange and remain separate from the non-market, wholly internally planned Department of Corrections prison of keep processes. Mm. The, our categorization will yield some errors. Um, so for example, you do sometimes encounter a prison farm to table program in which prisoners farm and consume their product, which is entirely domestic and reproductive, but it would be recorded as farming and then incorrectly coded as enterprise here. Um, or going in the other direction, an arrangement in which a non-DOC agency like a school might bring items such as worn auditorium chairs to the prison for repair, uh, which is a, an example from Massachusetts. This involves an exchange between agencies. Uh, so we would want to have coded that as enterprise, but it would be recorded as maintenance or repair and then incorrectly coded as prison upkeep. Um, but we think that these, these will be pretty rare. Okay. so. Finally, on to our findings. The y-axis here is the percentage of work assignments in either labor category out of the total number of work assignments at the time of each survey, which are given in their absolute terms in the blue numbers on top. And since the vast majority of prisoners have one work assignment, this is effectively a graph of which type of job each prisoner has. And just Quickly, if you were in, to instead plot with a unit of hours worked for each type of work, um, <clears throat> that would make the purple enterprise slice a little bit bigger since enterprise jobs often carry moderately longer work schedules, but the difference is very small. Um, so as you can see, the story here is that incarcerated workers primarily do prison upkeep labor. And this is a very steady fact. Throughout this period, on average, 76% of work assignments were in prison upkeep, 
with a low of 72% in 1974 and a high of 84% in 1979. Um, we'll offer broader scale of labor context for this graph shortly. But first, um, <clears throat> this graph doesn't indicate whether an enterprise job is done for the state or for a private corporation because we can't reflect that information with the SPI data. So let's take a look at that with some other data. Um, oh, is there a, a hand from Andy? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. So the, the 214K, the 791K, that's the total number of workers in a given year? Yes, exactly. Thank you. And uh, Eric, you have six and a half minutes left. Whoa, okay. Uh, cool. I'll change my approach slightly. <clears throat> um, okay. So, great. Okay, so briefly the, here, let me just reorient really quickly. Here, would it be okay if I took a couple more minutes? Yeah, but hurry. Okay, okay, okay. Um, okay, so this is the number of incarcerated workers in uh, prison industry enhancement programs, which is for our purposes, all prisoners who labor for private corporations. Um, and you can see here that it hovers around 5,000, which represents the smallest fraction of incarcerated workers at 0.6% and an even tinier one of all incarcerated people in general at 0.4%. So the absence of private corporations among the factors that determine the contours of modern prison labor is I think quite striking and evidenced here. So now we'll turn to the scale of labor. Um, let's look at the blue job holding line, which shows the percentage of prisoners with a work assignment at the time of the survey regardless of what that assignment is or how many hours per week they work it. So as a matter of percentage, the story is that job holding declines very consistently from 78% to 61% over the course of the prison boom. And this is what this looks like in absolute figures. Um, and you can see there are actually declines in absolute terms after 2004 in job holding, which is a remarkable fact. So this doesn't reflect how many hours per week each job represents. So we'll turn to that now. Um, this is the, the distribution of weekly hours worked in 1974. Um, and you can see at the bottom left, how we construct an idleness measure, which includes anyone who doesn't work or who works up to 10 hours per week, which is likely to be two hours per day. And this just allows us to combine job holding with weekly hours worked into one easy metric for considering the scale of labor. Um, so as you can see in 1974, there's a large portion of um, jobless prisoners. There's a large portion of people who are these sort of full-time jobs and then a smattering throughout kind of part-time jobs and these extra high work schedules. Um, and now we'll compare it to 2004's distribution. So the clear story here is that there's a leftward shift. So the no or low hour jobs on the left side of the distribution come to make up a larger percentage of all jobs in 2004 than they did three decades earlier. Um, and uh, attending to idleness, so the leftmost three bars together sum to um, in 1974, they summed to um, 28%. And in 2004, so near the peak of the prison boom, they summed to 54%. Um, so the story here is that um, by 2004, idleness reaches majority levels. It becomes a sort of defining, the, the primary characteristic of prisons with regards to labor. And this is what the absolute figures look like. Um, mm -hmm. And these are those histograms consolidated side by side 
Um, so we'll breeze past this for now because it's largely emphasis. So now we're returning to our big picture proportions graph and we'll, we're plotting idleness according to our definition. So again, it's if, if you're jobless or if you work up to 10 hours uh, per week. Um, and as you can see, as I mentioned before, um, by 2004, the majority of prisoners either do no work or they do up to 10 hours of work per week, which would be an hour or two a day in a five day work week. Um, and this seems to demonstrate that the construction of mass incarceration was the process of caging more and more people not to labor, but to be idled with regards to formal work which has important implications for how we understand mass incarceration. <clears throat> and this is, this is what the uh, absolute figures look like. So we'll close with some uh, summary and analysis. Um, so with regards to the scale of labor, during the prison boom, idleness surpassed work as the dominant characteristic of prisons with regards to prison labor. And with regards to the content of the labor, throughout this period, the prison labor that does occur remains primarily devoted to the non-market domestic reproduction of the prisons and prisoners. Um, and I'd be happy to offer some, some speculation on, on why that is in the discussion. <clears throat> and our closing analysis. Um, so first, beginning with the prison labor that does occur, uh, before zooming out to consider the implications for understanding mass incarceration more broadly, um, is the use of prison labor profiteering? Uh, our, our answer is no, it's not. It's infrequently done for private corporations, it's work done for the state, and it's better understood as carceral workfare or work obligations to the, to the state in exchange for the carceral welfare of room and board in prisons. Um, and prison labor is also better understood to have a central purpose of contributing to the prison system of social control and discipline. Um, the labor economists here would likely tell you that an efficient system of labor exploitation would look like the smallest number of workers working the highest number of hours possible whereas the lower hour jobs spread out across more prisoners is more suitable for a system that doesn't aim to extract as much value as possible from each prisoner, but rather seeks to ensnare as many prisoners as possible in a centralized social order. Um, and so I think just a couple, couple, just a minute to wrap up this slide. Um, is mass incarceration a program of captive labor exploitation? Um, our answer is simply no. Um, if it were, we would have seen levels of labor rise and we would have seen more labor in the form of private commodity production, but levels of labor drop and most labor is done for the state simply to reproduce prison. Um, now, to zoom out a little bit into a little more inter interpretation while the facts of prison labor and idleness, of course, don't provide a comprehensive approach to examining the broader economic functions of prisons, um, we do think that the fact of prevalent prison idleness does bolster a view um, that mass incarceration meets neoliberal capitalism's dual imperative of managing surplus population and disciplining labor at once. So the mass warehousing of surplus life serves to contain and disappear the human wreckage of neoliberal restructuring, while also constituting that approach to managing poverty that avoids the ameliorative tactics of the earlier era of regulated capitalism, which would threaten to augment the bargaining power of labor. Um, so I'll, and I'd be happy to address the, the last question up here, why does the new slavery misconception misconce persist in the Q&A? But I'll just close by stating that um, our view that the political economy of mass incarceration is not that of chattel slavery, and it's not that of the convict leasing of reconstruction, both of which were driven by a core imperative to labor exploitation, but rather it's a new 
peculiar set of economic arrangements that appears as a network of warehouses for neoliberal capitalism's surplus life. Um, and with that, thank you for listening. Um, apologies that I went over a couple of minutes. I'm really excited for the, the rest of the presentations. Uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, next up will be uh, Andrew Keefe, uh, who will be uh, so who will be uh, talking about racial income inequality. Um, and so go ahead. Andrew. All right. Can you all hear me OK? And can you see my slides? Yes, yes. perfect. Thank you. OK, perfect. All right, so good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's afternoon here in Dublin. Um, thanks for that, Eric, that was awesome. Thanks, Gert, for organizing this session. Uh, it's wonderful to meet you, Hannah and Anastasia. And thanks, Lisa, also for, uh, for setting us up today. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, before I get started, I'd just like to recognize my collaborator, Adana Usmani, who is unfortunately unable to join us today, uh, but he sends his regards and is happy to follow up uh, on any questions over email. And I've listed our email addresses uh, in the last slide. Okay, let's get started. So our work is motivated by the desire to establish some basic facts about the wages of incarcerated people during the era of mass incarceration. There has been substantial public and some academic attention paid to this issue. Popular news media per periodically report on unpaid and underpaid inmates, such as those fighting fires in California and others producing hand sanitizer in New York. A recent study by Courtney Crittenden and colleagues found that paid work is more often assigned to white inmates, especially among men. Uh, ethnographic work by Michael Gibson Light has shown that whether inmates are assigned paid high status assignments also shapes how they seek dignity in prison um, and, has and he has concluded that competition among inmates serves to reify penal labor structures, inequity, and control. Yet when it comes to wages, although we have anecdotes, Adoner and I were not able to find any study describing the distribution of workers' earnings and how this varies by race, by age, by time, uh, by place, et cetera. So we know very little about how much inmates are actually paid. Uh, and this is in part because conventional surveys such as the census and current population survey either don't count incarcerated people or they do, but don't ask them about their earnings. So that is what we have set out to do in this project. We, we think that generating some basic data points about inmates' earnings could help improve how we think about race, punishment, and inequality. Um, and I'll say more about this at the end, but we think a descriptive analysis such as this one uh, could also have um, some useful empirical, theoretical, normative, and maybe even political implications. Um, so I'm, this is sort of where we're headed in the next few minutes. So I'm going to go over the motivation. I'll just discuss the motivation. Uh, uh, I'm going to say just a brief word about the data, but I think since um, since several of us are using uh, the SPI, I'll just keep my remarks brief. Um, and then I'm going to go over our findings, some implications, um, and I suppose we're saving questions till the end. So I'll just uh, wait until then. All right, so uh, we are using uh, six waves of the survey of inmates in state correctional facilities. Uh, so the survey was administered as Eric mentioned to nationally representative samples of incarcerated people at irregular intervals and, um, and the survey asked them to self-report earnings and work information. Um, we should note that our analysis for the time being is limited to men of working age. So at this point, we will have nothing to say about gender-based inequality in work or earnings. We're also just looking at data on earnings from uh, within prison job assignments, such as on-site laundry and kitchen duties, which make up most of uh, work assignments. Uh, there are some non-obvious difficult decisions we have to make to render these data usable. I won't say anything about these in the interest of time, but I would be happy to say more during the Q&A. Uh, 
Okay, so in a short presentation, we can't talk about everything that is interesting. So let me just focus on five findings in the time that I have. So first, a fact about the overall distribution of earnings in American prisons. Most incarcerated workers work for zero pay. This is shown in the graphs on your screen. These are kind of confusing when you first take a look at them. So let me try to explain first just what you're seeing here. So these are called cumulative distribution functions or CDFs of log earnings. CDFs simply communicate the percentage of people making a certain income or below. The y-axis gives a percentile, the percentage of people uh, below you in the distribution. And the x-axis gives you uh, the corresponding level of earnings. So in the first panel to the left labeled everyone, you can see, you can, you can pick a percentile at random and ask, what are the earnings of someone at this percentile of the income distribution? What you see is that someone at say the 75th percentile of the earnings distribution of everyone in prison makes about five log dollars or about $150 per year in 2014 dollars from prison labor. That's about 50 cents per day, not much money. In addition to examining trends among all men ages 25 through 54, we also focus on working men, um, which who are those who reported working some amount of hours per week, and men with earnings who reported any income from their work. Okay, so that's how we read the graphs. I'd be happy to clarify if there are any questions, but let me press on in the interests of time. Um, one key thing to take away from these graphs, the one thing that we really want to convey about the overall distribution of earnings in prison is that a substantial proportion of the incarcerated workforce works for no pay. You can see this in the second panel of this graph, which is limited just to men who report having worked at some point in the year surveyed. About 50% of the people who worked in prison reported zero annual earnings. In other words, about half of working prisoners did not earn anything. The second fact that I'd like to convey is one about racial inequality. So we observe substantial racial inequality in earnings inside prisons. As of 2004, the year that the data represented in these CDFs were collected, the median non-Hispanic white inmate made more than the median non-Hispanic black inmate who made more than the median Hispanic inmate. Now, it is perhaps not that surprising that there are white non-white inequalities in prison but what is surprising, or at least interesting, we think, is that this racial inequality is not a function of the amount of money paid to those who earn money. If we limit our analysis to those who earn money, there are no racial inequalities, which you can see in the CDF for earners to the far right. Rather, racial inequality in earnings seems to be a function of inequality in access to paid work assignments. Black and Hispanic workers make less than white workers, not because once they're employed in a paid assignment, they make less, but because they are less likely to be given paid assignments. I'll say more about this again in a minute. We can also examine racial inequality by running regressions of log earnings on race and controlling for age categories. We do this by following the same procedures used in recent work by Patrick Bayer and Kerwin Charles to estimate racial earnings level gaps in the US population of working age men. We find that racial earnings level gaps among incarcerated workers have historically been narrower uh, than that um, between black and white workers in the general population, but were wider by the end of the 90s prison boom. Here we see the coefficient characterizing the differences between white and black and white and Hispanic men. Um, we see that these differences are both greater than the coefficients generated by Bayer and Charles at the median and 90th quantile during roughly the same period. Our third finding is that both of the previous two facts have worsened over time. First, there has been an increase in uh, the share of prisoners who reported zero earnings. In 1974, a little more than 50% of all inmates reported zero earnings. In 2004, this was about 64%. Second, there has been an increase in racial inequality. In 1974, you can see that the black, blue, and red lines were closer to overlapping than they were in 2004. This indicates increasing racial inequality, especially between Hispanic workers and black and white workers. We are still thinking through what might explain these trends. No doubt 
uh, you all have some ideas for us and we very much look forward to hearing them. One idea we've been considering recently in light of Gibson Light's work is that prisons may have increasingly racialized inmates through pay to work assignments in order to divide and control the growing inmate population. Along with increasing an increasing rate of idleness and uh, non-work that um, those, those rates that, that Eric talked about, increasing racialization might explain why, according to recent work by Adam Reich, the number of strikes in American prisons peaked and then declined precipitously between the early 1970s and 90s. So it's kind of a story of social control, controlling the growing incarcerated population. Alternatively, the trends we observe might be better explained by dramatic variation in the earnings distribution by state, which is uh, our fourth finding. For instance, in New York, you see that most inmates make some income. This is because most have a work assignment and almost all of those who are working are paid. Someone who makes zero earnings is at the bottom of the income distribution. In California, however, a large share of workers make nothing and thus only a minority of inmates have any income. Curiously, in California, racial inequality is reversed. The share of Hispanic workers making zero is greater than the share of white workers, which is greater than the share for black workers. And then you have states like Florida and Georgia where basically everyone reports zero earnings. What this suggests, and this will be unsurprising to scholars of mass incarceration, is that there is no single system in America, but in fact a patchwork of 50 systems configuring the incarcerated workforce. Um, this last fact relates to our final finding, which is still preliminary. We wanted to understand the determinants of the racial inequality we observed. Is racial inequality a result of differences in individual qualifications and experiences? Is it a result of the type of work assigned or how many hours are assigned? We found that neither of these sets of individual uh, or prison level institutional factors explains any of the gap in a single uh, in a simple log level regression in which we model log wages for all inmates in 2004. The first line of the figure on your screen shows the raw wage gap, the coefficient on race and a regression that contains nothing else. As you can see uh, from the second and third lines of the graph, the coefficient on race is pretty stable, even as we add other variables that we might expect to affect prison wages, including education and employment status, pre-arrest um, and occupation and weekly out, uh, work hours in prison. Uh, the variable which closes the gap most significantly, though not entirely, is the state in which an inmate was incarcerated. This is consistent with our earlier finding that state level institutional factors matter a lot. In this regression sense, uh, inmates, state, uh, inmate state explains over half of the earnings gap between white and black men and over a third of the gap between white and Hispanic men. Uh, as I explained earlier, we do not find racial inequality among earners, and thus it is not surprising that when we control for whether the inmate received any income in the second to the last line at the bottom, our raw gap is almost entirely explained away. Okay, that only scratches the surface, but I wanted to leave time to say something about what we think all this adds up to. So we think there are at least four important implications of the analysis. First, we think the analysis suggests that we may be able to paint a more accurate picture of overall income inequality in the United States. Adana and I began this project after observing, as other scholars have, that studies of the US earnings distribution that use conventional surveys omit incarcerated workers uh, because they use samples of the non-institutionalized. Sociologists, most notably Becky Pettit and Bruce Western have tried to correct for this by imputing earnings to the incarcerated population or by assuming that the population has zero earnings. But we see no reason why we shouldn't estimate these earnings directly to get a fuller account of the earnings of all those who work in America. There is some reason to think that this fuller picture might give us a better estimate of racial inequality in particular, given how racialized incarceration and prison labor are. Second, we think that this study has implications for theories of the prison. Uh, existing theories have discussed prisons as labor market institutions that mark workers with a criminal record uh, and discipline them to accept certain kinds of conditions upon release. One implication of our study is that this disciplining, this disciplining work involves racializing inmates. It is a case of what Karen and Barbara Fields have called racecraft. 
the fact that the racial income gaps we observed in our regression analysis lingered after, after adding controls suggests that prisons distribute work assignments in, ways, in, in racist ways and that the gaps are largely a function of racism inside rather than outside of prisons. In the next phase of our analysis, we plan to use restricted use data to test this hypothesis further by adding more controls, including facility type and length of time served. Uh, our third finding, uh, or our third implication of our findings is that we think that there are important, um, we think that there are some, some important normative implications. So uh, if we can agree that it is wrong to work without pay, um, then we think it is wrong that so many people in American prisons are working without pay. It is immoral for private industry uh, to reap profit from unpaid and underpaid prison labor, even if this isn't um, sort of the most common type of prison labor experience. Um, and it's also wrong for the state to balance its correctional budgets by placing the burden of prison upkeep on inmates without fair compensation. The moral bankruptcy of the US prison system with, with respect to wages is particularly evident when we compare the system to systems in other countries. In Denmark, for example, inmates have a duty to work uh, 37 hours per week, but they are always paid and granted paid sick leave. In Ireland, uh, inmates are not required to work um, and are actually paid a minimum uh, one euro and 70 cents daily, regardless of their work status. We think that this argument um, is sharpened by recognizing the racism embedded in prison labor exploitation. Whereas discourse on mass incarceration has recognized that the US criminal justice system disproportionately contacts and incarcerates black and Latinx people, it has paid less attention to how the system disparately treats people once they are incarcerated. Our study highlights racial inequality in this area of, of the system and thus helps build the case for reforming or abolishing prisons. Finally, we think that our research suggests strategies for defending the labor rights of the incarcerated. Uh, last June, Democrats in Congress reintroduced the abolition amendment, a joint resolution to close what some have dubbed uh, the slavery loophole of the 13th amendment by prohibiting slavery and involuntary servitude as punishments for a crime. The resolution followed frustrated attempts to secure protections for inmates under the Fair Labor Standards Act and other employment statutes as courts have held that incarcerated people are not employees and are therefore not protected. We contribute to the effort to defend the rights of incarcerated workers by drawing attention to prison labor and by establishing some facts that could potentially support legal actions short of a constitutional amendment. Since the data show reported earnings by state, our findings may support civil lawsuits against states in which inmates reported earning less than the minimum wage set by statute or regulation. Uh, and the data allow us to identify rates of unpaid work among incarcerated people who haven't been convicted, such as pretrial detainees. Um, uh, and those you know, who are guaranteed protections under the 13th amendment, at least nominally. Um, so I'm happy to talk more about these strategies uh, and the analysis and the findings during the Q&A. Uh, but for now, thanks so much again. And I really look forward to y'all's questions and reactions. Uh, Andrew, there was one clarifying question uh, oh. about uh, slide seven. Uh, the question is about how is the inequality in work assignments calculated? Um, slide seven here. So, so we are. Um, so we're just we're just uh, modeling the distribution, uh, disaggregating it by race. That's all we're doing here. Does that make? Yes, that makes perfect sense. Okay. It's observed from the data. Yep. Yep. Uh, so. Um, uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, that's a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, next up, we have Hannah uh, Archambault from uh, UMass Amherst, uh, who's going to talk about work in the post Fortis prison. Okay. Um, oh, sorry, my Zoom skills have uh, shrunk in the last semester because I didn't teach last semester for the first time in like ever. So in like seven years. Uh, let's see. Share screen. <clears throat> 
Mm. Great. Okay. So, um, so I'm talking about um, reproducing prisons and racial capitalism. Um, and identifying the work incarcerating, incarcerated workers do in a racial post fortis capitalism. There's a lot of overlap um, between all of our uh, papers here. So uh, it'll be interesting to talk about them sort of all at once. Um, so my research question for this, um, this is part of a bigger project, um, which is called Prison Work, Work Ethic and Social Control. Um, so this is just the first part of it. Um, so the research question for this part is what kind of work do incarcerated workers do? Um, and can this work fulfill the stated goals of prison work as it's described by the prison apparatus and its arbiters? Um, to do this, I need to first establish what kind of work is done by incarcerated workers in prisons. And I use the data from the 2016 survey of prisoners. Um, and then I analyze the impacts of race and gender on assignment uh, allocation in particular, uh, and also consider the ways that education and having a job before incarceration and having a recent violation in prison um, have differing impacts on assignment allocation uh, by race and gender, especially. Um, I then contextualize these patterns of assignment allocation um, into the current racialized and gendered capitalist conditions, um, which I refer to as racial post-Fordism. I'm not going to go into uh, the development of the category of racial post-Fordism as our current economic moment, so just leave it at that, although I will talk about the conditions themselves. Um, and my key finding is that most of the work in the prison is work that reproduces the prison, um, which we've already heard from Eric and Gert, um, but I'll go in more detail about it, um, and that it is allocated in ways that map onto broader economic and social conditions outside of the prison. And then I'll talk about some implications of that. So um, what are the goals of prison work? Um, the carceral system provides many justifications for prison work, um, but we can sort of summarize them into a few specific forms. Uh, the first is prison work is a benefit to society, um, meaning, of course, carceral society specifically. Um, it's an ostensible benefit uh, because prison workers may save money for prisons um, uh, or for unincarcerated workers, aka taxpayers, in the language of the people who justify the carceral systems um, and prison work in it specifically. Um, similarly, uh, another idea is that um, it might make money for individual firms via private work. Um, this aspect um, is less in the rhetoric that comes from the prison apparatus and more uh, disseminated to the public, the less in the rhetoric that comes from the prison apparatus to be disseminated to the public and more in apparent in the marketing of prison workforce um, workforces to private firms and by prison administrators. Um, and it's also emphasized by a lot of prison reformists and some abolitionists as well. Um, one of the key justifications provided by the carceral state is that uh, prison work facilitates incarcerated people uh, being prepared for life after uh, release by providing them with meaningful work that builds usable skills. Um, uh, that uh, And by instilling a work ethic um, into inc incarcerated workers uh, with the assumption that a lack of both skills and motivation to work, meaning an occupation in the formal economy specifically, um, was lacking before incarceration um, and perhaps was a driving force behind incarceration in the first place. Um, this framing places the burden of economic privation on individual workers uh, and only tangentially acknowledges even a lack of opportunity to access the opportunities to engage in the formal economy um, on a social level. Um, let alone the broader conditions of racial capitalism that force workers into economically and socialized, socially marginalized positions. Um, work in the prison also serves as both a punishment and privilege. Um, prison workers are subject to degrading and often dangerous working conditions, uh, and this work is necessarily coerced, um, and it happens under the constant threat of violence. 
Um, at the same time, work functions as a privilege, uh, since the alternative is also um, often stultifying boredom due to the idleness that Garrett and Eric discussed previously. Um, so to uh, sort of achieve these goals of first understanding what kind of work uh, prisoners do, I also use uh, the survey of prison inmates. Um, I use the 2016 survey, um, which just came out in January of 2021. Um, usually uh, this happens every five years, um, but the most recent incarnation, there was a 12 year gap between surveys, which I think speaks to the fact that prisons don't like to share this data. Um, <clears throat> and I focus on um, the state level, uh, data because of the fact that, as mentioned before, that the vast majority of people are incarcerated in state prisons. So <clears throat> the total sample uh, collected by the BJS for the 2016 uh, survey was selected in a two-stage process, um, resulted in 273 male facilities and 91 female facilities um, for a total of 18,546 uh, male individuals and 6,302 uh, female individuals who were interviewed. Um, <clears throat> this resulted in a total of 11,551 observations um, and 7,380 of those people who are the observations um, had a work assignment and 2,873 of those who answered the full set of job assignment questions. So that is my data set is that 200 and uh, 2,873 people. So this is just a breakdown, um, sort of the raw data uh, for work assignments uh, ordered by the prevalence of the assignment. So as mentioned, um, <clears throat> the survey has 10 types of work assignments, janitorial, grounds, food, laundry, hospital, farming, industry, other services, maintenance, and other. Um, janitorial assignments were the most common, um, which were 28% of the incarcerated people had. So almost a third of incarcerated workers um, had janitorial assignments. Uh, the next most common was food and food preparation, um, followed by other services, which includes assignments like barbershop, commissary, um, office work, et cetera. Uh, industry accounted for uh, under 6% of the work assignments in my sample. Um, and just looking at this, we can immediately see some differences by sex and race, um, especially in terms of janitorial assignments where women had assignments much less often than men um, and non-white workers more often than white workers. Um, and in other services um, where women and white workers were assigned to these tasks more than men or black workers. Um, and also in goods in which white workers were assigned to these assigned more often um, and in maintenance in which women were assigned these tasks more often. Um, so I dove into this further by uh, using a linear probability model. And so for this, I aggregated these 10 types of assignments into four categories um, instead of the two that Geert and Eric used. Um, so I have janitorial and maintenance, reproductive and affective, industry and farming, and other. Um, janitorial and maintenance includes janitorial grounds and maintenance obviously. Reproductive and affective includes food, laundry, hospital, and other services. Um, other is all the other uncategorized assignments, so I don't spend a lot of time on this one. Um, together, reproductive and affective and janitorial and maintenance made up 83% of assignments in the 2016 data. Um, and so I analyzed this data using a linear regression analysis, linear probability regression analysis. And for the assignment allocation data, I ran four separate regressions initially. I constructed binary variables where one was indicated that the worker had an assignment, and zero indicated that they did not have assignment of that kind. Um, my categorization is influenced by the theoretical and empirical analyses of the, of the contemporary economy, um, including Marxist feminist and social reproduction analysis, um, Marxist theories of post-fortive affective work, um, and empirical and theoretical insights from theories of racial capitalism and stratification economics. Um, it's also in response to the outsized focus on goods producing work inside prisons um, in some forms of prison reform um, activism, as uh, has been mentioned already too. 
So this is just a plot of the marginal results of the regression analyses. I didn't include all of the controls, just some of the more important ones here. Um, the full regressions with all the controls are, I can show those later if you're interested in Q&A. Um, so for industry, um, the differences are relatively small, but they're still significant. Um, Non-white and especially black incarcerated workers are less likely to have industry jobs. We saw this even in the data before. Um, women are much less likely to have janitorial jobs as men, um, as are people with more education. And non-white incarcerated people are more likely to have janitorial positions. Um, for reproductive and affective jobs, I'm gonna kind of skip over other because not a lot happens there and we don't really know what it is so it's not really uh, relevant at this moment so um as in terms of reproductive and affective jobs you'll see that women are more likely uh, to have jobs in this category um, as are black incarcerated workers um workers with higher education were also more likely to have reproductive or affective jobs so overall there were no surprises here um it reflected um sort of what we saw in the raw data um the jobs that ostensibly provide the most benefit in terms of jobs training um, are and are the most likely to be paid um, uh, go mostly to uh, white work, uh, white, um, yeah, the ones that have the most benefit are most likely to go to white workers or um, to some extent also to uh, women. And women workers and black workers were both uh, more likely to have reproductive and affective jobs. So there were some important differences when I ran the regressions on subgroups by race, especially in janitorial and reproduction. Um, so while women in every racial category were less likely to have janitorial jobs than men, uh, for white women, it was by 12 percentage points. Um, and the negative likelihood was much smaller for black women. Um, white women were also more likely than white men to have other jobs, but the difference for black women and other women were not significant. Um, white men, women and black women were similarly more likely to be assigned reproductive jobs than either white men or black men. Um, and this is an interesting result taken in the context of the differences between white and black women compared to white and black men in janitorial and maintenance jobs. Um, and one interpretation of that could be that while reproductive work is feminized um, regardless of race, racialized occupational segmentation um, applies more to janitorial jobs. Um, of course, we know that race and gender do interact, um, and it, it, part of why this is an interesting finding is for exactly that reason. Um, so I suspected that there might be some differences between the disaggregated assignment types. Um, so I analyzed each of the 10 types on their own, uh, and there were some diff important differences. Um, so these four types of work are the most common or the most analytically significant. Um, and we see that in particular, black workers were less likely to have maintenance jobs, but more likely to have janitorial jobs, um, both of which were in one aggregated, aggregated category previously. Um, black workers were also more likely to have jobs relating to food and food services, but less likely to have jobs in other services. Um, the assignments of within categories um, was a lot more stable for women. Um, there weren't these kinds of contradictory within category um, issues that there were for uh, men. Um, so related to this is there were variations on the returns to education, um, previously having a job and recent violations based on race um, in some of these key categories as well. Um, so overall white workers, um, in terms of the probability of working in some of the key job types, they were more sensitive to other variables, especially in the janitorial and uh, other services jobs, um, which are kind of the poles of the non good producing work that happens in prison in which other services could be mapped on to more professional type jobs, um, especially since a lot of it is clerical, etc, or some of it um, in janitorial more as lower wage and de skilled type jobs. Um, both white and black workers were less likely to work janitorial jobs if they had a college degree, um, even more so for black incarcerated workers. Uh, but white workers um, probability changed more if they had a job before they were arrested or if they had a violation uh, while they were in prison, a recent violation. Um, white workers also saw significantly higher gains in probability um, by educational attainment than uh, black workers did in other services jobs. Um, white workers also had some variation by education and recent vi uh, violation uh, where black workers did not. 
Um, it's worth noting that for white incarcerated workers, a recent violation made them more likely to get work in the food category. Um, given that black incarcerated workers were significantly more likely to work in food related assignments overall, it's possible that this increase in working in food is actually a demotion um, for white workers. Um, so now that I've established the work that happens inside prisons, and that it's mostly reproductive of the prison and prisoners, um, and the allocation of these jobs is both racialized and gendered, we can contextualize these into the overall racial post-Fordist economy. Um, so first, just to note, racial post-Fordism is an ongoing process. It's a set of changes rather than a set of conditions. Um, but we can observe these changes over time to understand our current conditions. So it's these current conditions that I'm going to focus on. Um, so racial post-Fordism um, is racial in the way that all capitalism is racial, um, is defined by Cedric Robinson. And feminist economics and Marxist feminist economics in particular um, have analyzed and described the ways in which capitalism is also patriarchal. Um, there's been a significant shift from work that produces goods to service work between 1970 and now, a set of changes that I'm all sure we are familiar with. Um, and a significant amount of this work is reproductive and highly affective, and it's also segmented into lower wage and higher wage work uh, within this in ways that are both racialized and gendered. Um, this segmentation is also related to the simultaneous process of de-skilling um, and the changing of the types of skills that are required um, that are to those that are affective and flexible, um, while simultaneously creating a situation in which workers are individualized. Um, occupational segregation has been a feature of racial capitalism throughout its development. Um, stratification economists have empirically demonstrated that this occupational segregation along the lines of race and gender exists. Um, people of color are stuck in lower paying work and locked out of the higher paying sort of creative professional work that has increased in prevalence as part of the post fordist process to a significant extent. Um, Marxist feminists, both historically and in contemporary works, have pointed out that women are relegated to reproductive work. Um, so in these patterns, again, overlap and interact in ways that reinforce the hierarchies that capitalism both reproduces and relies on as a method of social control. Um, this is just some quick data that I analyzed from the 2020 census data um, by detailed occupation type. Um, where I define overrepresentation as in an occupation uh, for Black workers if they make up 25% or more of the workforce in that occupation. And in the top 20 jobs that I identified, one third that uh, Black workers are overrepresented in are reproductive jobs, which are almost entirely low wage, like home health aides and orderlies. Um, and uh, half the occupations are in service or transportation jobs, like postal service clerks um, and dry cleaning workers. Um, recycling and refuse jobs are 12th, um, and the remaining portion are largely security jobs. Um, it's worth noting that furthermore, if we considered being incarcerated a job, it would be the seventh most um, intense in terms of occupational segregation um, by Black people in the United States um, by 30, at, we're at 33% of Black workers. Um, so white workers are 78.5% of the workforce, and I count occupations in which white workers are overrepresented in as where they're 90% of workers, and they're overrepresented in high wage, high skill, or specific skill uh, production and repair jobs, as well as professional and creative jobs. And only two of the top 20 jobs are relatively low wage reproductive jobs. So given the preceding analyses, we can evaluate the, evaluate the claims that the prison makes about prison work. Um, and in particular, the claim that prisons provide prison workers with meaningful skills um, that can be used after release. Um, it's important to note that when this is discussed in prison documentation, um, official prison justifications of prison work, um, and, and most of the mainstream criminological literature, and even in some prison reformist discussions, um, this work is assumed to be largely industrial type work. Um, we found, however, that most prison work reproduces the prison and the people incarcerated within it. Um, and only 6% of workers inside prisons um, are involved in any kind of in potentially industrial type work. Uh, maintenance work, which includes um, repair and similar activities, is maybe related, but it's only about 6% of the total work in done inside prisons. So 
one conclusion you could try, draw from this would be that prison work fails to prepare prison workers for life outside the prison. It does not provide these skills um, that it says it does and thus fails in its, uh, in its goals. I suggest, however, um, that this prison work is in fact um, appropriate for the conditions of racial post-Fordism. Uh, the racialized and gendered way that work is allocated inside prisons is reflective of patterns outside prisons in which Black workers are pushed into lower wage, de-skilled jobs. Um, in this data, it was particularly apparent in the differences between janitorial and maintenance type jobs, where Black workers were more likely to have drudgerous janitorial work assignments in prisons and less likely to have the kinds of maintenance jobs that might involve repair and installation tasks that are higher wage and white dominated outside of the prison. Um, the same is true for women being more likely to be pushed into reproductive work. Um, it's unlikely that this happens by design in the prison, um, but rather it indicates the way that the prison is integrated into the racial post-Fordist economy overall. So the prison doesn't just reflect the free economy, um, it also reproduces it in the process of prison work done by incarcerated workers. Um, some of the political implications of this is that focusing on the role that prison work is uh, privatized or even paid um, is inadequate in terms of prison reform um, and points and it also points to the centrality of the prison and the carceral state generally in reinforcing the racial capitalist hierarchies and social control that facilitate the ongoing process of exploitation, alienation and capitalist accumulation. Um, there's another, I'm not going to go into this for this, there's another set of really interesting questions for this, um, where they ask about the relative importance uh, to incarcerated workers um, of sort of some different aspects of relieving boredom, of gaining skills, of making money, of making friends, um, which can help to point to um, the sort of subjectivities that the prison may produce in this and the ways that that interacts with uh, work outside of the prison. Um, but for the uh, purposes of this uh, presentation, I'm going to end here. Um, so. Thank you so much, Hannah. No problem. Let me see <clears throat> if I can figure uh, out how to There we go. Uh, next up is Anastasia Wilson, Wilson from Hobart and William Smith Colleges, uh, and she's going to talk about, uh, I think, not the SPI data, but instead about uh, schooling in racial capitalist America. Um, go ahead, Anastasia. Yeah, one moment. I'm on a new laptop and realizing that maybe I can't share my screen like I thought I could. Um, oh, well. Well, we'll just forgo that. Good thing I wrote it out. Um, uh, so yeah, um, unfortunately, yeah, I can't share my slides, um, but I'm going to be sort of like the wild card here in this set of presentations um, in talking about schools as an uh, institution that is um, actually key in the prison regime. So this is gonna be a much sort of wider scope of things than the previous presentations, um, which were all um, super interesting. And so hopefully this can open up some of our conversation and the discussion about some of the theoretical implications and like what this means for you know, capitalism um, and so on. So um, yeah, so I guess I'll just talk <laughs> since I can't share my slides. All right, so the other presentations here on this panel um, explore modern prison labor, both descriptively and in relation to our theoretical understanding of the relationship between prisons and capitalism, including how prison labor reinforces the work ethic, reproduces the prison itself, and reinforces uh, configurations of race in contemporary racial capitalism. My presentation is going to take a wider scope, and I'm going to examine an often under-discussed link between capitalism public education with a focus on K through 12 schools, public K through 12 schools, prisons, um, and the social services that are situated within the larger carceral apparatus. So I'm hoping that this brings us to like a wider lens on what constitutes the prison system and raises some critical questions about the role of the state and these sort of carceral forms of care um, in a capitalist society and economy. So the question I'm going to be asking is, what do schools do? 
Um, it seems pretty simple at first, and there's a lot of work um, in different sort of theoretical schools um, about this question, like what do schools do in society? Um, but I think that it requires further interrogation. Uh, recent crises of public health, the pandemic, uh, policing and mass incarceration, renewed interest in this notion of social reproduction have raised a lot of questions about the role of schooling in our contemporary society. <clears throat> Within economics and radical political economy, there are contending schools of thought that conceptualize what this role of the school is quite differently and with very different implications. So I will very quickly go over those um, in, in a little bit. Um, similar to Hannah's presentation, um, in this, I am going to sort of, in the background of this is the idea of a post fortis racial capitalism configuration. Um, and what's important about that is that in, in terms of theory, I want to be able to situate the role of class struggle and struggle against capital in how schools change and why schools have taken such a carceral turn, say since the 1960s and 1970s. Um, so in that sense, I'm going to be really trying to focus on sort of like the agency of the working class as the protagonist um, in this. And then of course, the sort of backlash that capital um, produces um, in response to that class struggle. Um, so just to make note, this is super colonial work. Um, so I'm still sort of hashing this out. Um, so I'll kind of go through um, what I've already sort of noted as I think interesting contributions to this question, what do schools do, and sort of the additional functions of school that I want to tack onto that under these particular conditions of, yeah, post fortis racial capitalism. Um, right, so I'm going to emphasize the role of working class struggle, in particular Black liberation struggles in sort of how it is that schools took the carceral turn that they have taken since the 1960s and 70s. And in particular, I'm also interested in understanding the role of school in a work society, right? A society that is organized almost entirely around work and how we do work. So work is gonna be sort of the, like the lens that I use um, to um, think about what are we doing at school? Um, what is the work that is done at the school by students, by teachers, by administrators. Um, so what I'm gonna find is that some of these roles are highly contradictory, um, which raises a lot of questions about the role of the state, the role of the worker, the revolutionary capacity of the workers and the school as a site of contestation um, and so on. Um, all right, so there's already a lot of, um, I think quite good theoretical work um, about uh, the role of schools in capitalism. Of course, you have classics like Schooling in Capitalist America, um, Altisser's work, talking largely about the ideological and sort of legitimation functions of the school. Um, you can also argue that um, the school as a sort of sorting board with its hidden curriculum reproduces that fragmented, racialized, and gendered working class for these particular conditions of current post fortis racial capitalism, which as Hannah pointed out, is always reconfiguring in response to, to sort of class struggle. Um, there are two additional functions that I'm interested in exploring for the school. So these two are the most, I think, already talked about, very well explored. There is such a large body of like Marxist education literature out there that I think is super interesting and pretty on point. But there are two additional functions of the school that I want to explore that has come up in the work that I did in my dissertation that focused on sort of how schools and prisons became enmeshed over time. So those two additional functions that I wanna talk about, um, one is how the school reproduces sort of like the working day for the students as well as for families and sort of compulsory work and the work ethic behind that. The second one is how schools sort of link the state capital and families to enforce a sort of coerced care work in the family through sort of um, the carceral imposition of family policing that occurs within schools. Um, so I'm going to talk mostly about those two um, today as I go through this. Um, so here I am not presenting 
many statistics or anything. I'm actually trying to build more of an argument. So this is very preliminary. And yeah, I'm trying to build a theoretical argument more so um, than sort of exploring um, the descriptives about it at this point. All right. So um, through this analysis, what I hope becomes clear is that <clears throat> um, over time, public education and the prison system have become deeply enmeshed and entwined. And in fact, we can argue that schools are um, a sort of key site of that prison system. Um, and so I'm using that question of the so-called school to prison pipeline as a kind of problematic to explore this question of like, what do schools do? Like, what do they actually do? Um, so first of all, I need to unpack this idea of the school to prison pipeline, um, which is where this question comes out of. Um, I don't like the pipeline metaphor. I think it is not particularly useful because it's sort of assuming that there's like this trade-off between education and incarceration. There are these sort of substitutes that if you just uh, educate our way out of this, we don't have to worry about um, incarceration. Um, but the reality of the situation is that schools and prisons are deeply enmeshed um, and that schools function as a site of the prison regime. How do they do that? They do that through criminalization of students, policing within schools, um, the use of things like referrals to law enforcement, um, mandated reporting by teachers, um, and sort of the intertwining of carceral social services like child protective services or department of social services, depending on what state you're in, um, within the school. So the school sort of functions as this fulcrum for all of these kind of carceral apparatuses of the state. Um, <clears throat> so um, yeah, so unpacking that pipeline metaphor, we can sort of say, um, yeah, what are those concrete ways in which schools are enmeshed with the prison system? Um, the first way is through just regular old school discipline, things like exclusionary school discipline, being suspended from school, being um, kicked out of school that exposes people to the carceral apparatus. Right. So you're not in school, you're out in the world, which we know is um, very much like drawing on like Laquant's work. Right. Um, you are much like more likely to be exposed to that carceral apparatus. <clears throat> um, students are directly criminalized in school, um, especially along the lines of race, especially black students. Um, so this is when school discipline becomes uh, a criminal charge against the student. Um, truancy laws and educational neglect laws um, then tie the students to the legal system. So skipping school can, um, for example, uh, end up with a truancy charge. And those truancy charges can often include things like fines and fees and will often tie the parents to the truancy charge as well or whoever the custodial guardian is um, of the student. Um, interestingly enough, uh, during the, the you know, pandemic virtual schooling, um, it's really interesting to note that there were several states where parents and students were given uh, truancy charges and court summons as a result of like skipping online school, no questions about whether or not you had internet access or like if there's something else going on. Um, so that sort of brings up the point about sort of, yeah, the, it, these, seem, these sort of things seem like they don't really make a lot of sense. So I want to be able to make sense, like, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this in school? Like, right, if this isn't the point of school, why are we doing it? Um, so I need to sort of use some of my theory to figure that out. Um, so yeah, schools are deeply enmeshed within the carceral apparatus. And um, I wanna cite uh, a book and an article um, that to me helps explain like how this came about. And it's a very particular study of Los Angeles public schools, but you can find examples within other school systems. Because um, like the prison system, the school system is a huge web of like independently operating institutions um, that constitute this big thing. Um, so I'm gonna cite the work of Damien Sojourner who um, has done a lot of, he's a radical anthropologist that has done a lot of work sort of uncovering the role of black liberation struggles in the sort of carceral turn of schools. And in particular, he's looking at Los Angeles public schools and actually the rise of the D.A.R.E. program. So cops in schools as teachers and cops in schools as sort of disciplinarians and patrol. Um, so Sojourner in First Strike, which is his book, and then the article Black Radicals Make for B Bad Citizens goes through um, various administrative documents and history 
um, about how radical black organizing at school prompted this carceral turn in educational policy. So the policy was a response to the struggles that were being waged by students at the school. Referencing particularly in LA, the Watts Rebellion and student strikes in LA public schools in 1968, he finds, I'm gonna read a quote, Within this void and failure of civil rights legislation to produce tangible benefits for the masses of black people, the city doubled back with the implementation of the police in government course, the course in the school. Although the program was portrayed as an altruistic act by the city to rectify tensions between black Angelinos and the police, the real intent was to further marginalize black people through conservative reform that tried to dampen black radicalism. In response to the black demands for control over the education to improve the situation within black schools, the city responded by investing in a program that sent police officers into schools. Similar models became the norm with respect to black communities and black education in the decades that followed the implementation of the police and government program. Within California, there was a greater withdrawal from publicly funded education due to the direct threat of organizations such as the Black Panther Party and the reliance upon public education as a key site of organizing. So I think this is really important because it's not just that the state wanted to you know, discipline just for fun, but there's a reason, right? There's a struggle, there's a crisis occurring within capitalism. Working class is engaging in struggle, which creates a crisis of capitalism. And this is the response. The response is to, of course, create a very carceral school environment. Um, so what I find is that most theories of education can't really help me to understand why this would be educational policy. Um, I won't even like go into it, but obviously human capital theory is not going to answer the question about, you know, why are there police in schools? Why do we criminalize students at school? Um, uh, I also find that a lot of the sort of Marxist analyses don't also answer this question exactly because there's much more of a focus on sort of ideology and the hidden curriculum um, and so on. So what I need to be able to answer is, okay, right now at this exact sort of snapshot in our capitalist society, what is the specific sort of work being done by these carceral schools. So the first bit of work that's being done um, by these carceral schools um, is, I think a point that mostly just builds on existing Mar Marxist literature, which is of course the reproduction of labor power. But like Hannah's presentation pointed out, what kind of labor power are, do we reproduce under these conditions? Well, it's highly racialized, it's highly fragmented, it's highly gendered, it's highly unequal. It's um, mostly sort of geared towards say service sector work or sort of low wage work in very flexible sort of ways. And I think you can see that sort of direct correspondence with these changes in schools. Um, further, you can also sort of make the argument of, well, if for, like we said in our presentations, if we do want to extend the analysis and say, well, all prisoners are workers, regardless whether or not they're, they're working, right? Sort of that bigger um, picture that you get from Marxist feminism of like, yeah, work is waged and unwaged. Well, students then might also be unwaged workers, right? And so what we're doing is students are involved in a very antagonistic process of reproducing themselves as workers who might be highly subject to being marginalized and criminalized um, by this system of sort of carceral schooling. Um, so that's sort of maybe not the plan, um, but certainly how this works out sort of um, in sort of class struggle. Um, another point that I want to develop, uh, I see I only have a few uh, minutes five left. Five minutes left. Yeah, another point that I want to develop, and I won't go too far into this because I want to get to my last point. Um, is thinking about sort of the relationship between work and school. And I already said we can conceptualize students as workers, right? That's what the wages for students, wages for homework movement tried to do is sort of take Marxist feminist analysis and autonomous Marxist analysis of the household as unwaged workers and think about students themselves as unwaged workers in a participating in a production process of their own commodity labor, their own labor power. Um, so I'm interested in asking the question about how compulsory schooling is sort of a response to particular capitalist crises and class struggle involving youth. 
and also involving the family as well, right? Um, Della Costa says in Women and the Subversion of Community, Capital excluded children from the home and sent them to school, not only because they are in the way of others more productive labor um, or to indoctrinate them, the rule of capital through the wage compels every able-bodied person to function under the law of the division of labor and to function in ways that are, if not immediately, then ultimately profitable for the expansion and extension of the rule of capital. So again, the social control sort of st story. If we can't use your labor, then we have to control it. So school seems like the way to do that. Um, I want to get to my last point, which is the one that I think is um, what I'm actually sort of building here is thinking about the school, not just in reproducing the future workers or labor power of students in the future um, or whatnot, but that the school through its ties to family policing reproduces the compulsory care of the family. So we know that from Marxist feminism, right? The family pro also produces labor power, right, produces future workers and current workers through sort of social reproduction. The school ties those families through sort of surveillance of, you know, how, how good is that care work working? Now, I think a lot of this is super well-intended, right? When we talk about things like mandated reporting or reporting of child abuse, there's very good intentions behind that, no doubt. The problem is that when schools are the site of say mandated reporting or of check-ins with child protection services or sort of the point of contact for other sorts of social services that tend to be carceral and punitive, the problem with that is that it's surveilling families, it's subjecting them to these various sort of carceral forms of state care without ever addressing that the origins of those say failures to provide care in the family are likely due to the failures of capitalism, are likely due to the failures of people to sort of have resources, um, the failures of the family form um, to not provide adequate care um, and so on. So what I'm thinking about is the role of the school isn't just about the student, right? And it's not just about the teacher and it's not just about the administration, but it's also about how it links it to regulating the family form and the forms of sort of coerced care that are mandated by capital to happen within the family. And if they don't, they're subject to very punitive, very carceral forms of care that are provided by the state by things like Department of Social Services. Um, and interestingly enough, in a lot of the literature on this, these programs often sort of leave families um, with sort of less resources and less care um, because of their carceral um, sort of tendency. So um, I guess I'll sort of conclude here sort of like what I think is um, sort of the contribution. I think that the main thing I want to sort of develop this is that link to the family. Um, and so I want to cite um, this really great book that I, I would argue sort of follows the line of like worker inquiry called Demystifying School. It's a volume that's edited by Miriam Wasserman. It um, sort of chronicles different reflections, interviews, essays by students, teachers in a very critical way, um, sort of what they think about sort of school. And in this book, Miriam Wasserman describes teachers as the sort of soft cops of capitalism who are in charge of doing this very contradictory dirty work to enforce discipline um, and I would argue extend to enforce the family form um, in capitalism. And she also acknowledges that being a soft cop and having to do this dirty work um, is very contradictory because it's not because teachers are also subject to um, sort of uh, the grip of capital, right? To being underpaid, underappreciated, et cetera. We see that right now with like what's going on in Chicago with the teachers union and teachers unions all over the country right now. And so she has this really great um, sort of thing where she says that part of undoing this sort of dirty work of capitalism also means confronting the reality uh, of the dirty work that's done to teachers. Um, and so she describes the school, she describes teachers as the fulcrum of the system. And I would argue that the school is sort of the fulcrum between capital, the state, and the family. And that fulcrum has increasingly been enforced through the carceral apparatus um, following the 1960s and 70s. So I'm gonna sort of end with this sort of 
quote from, from Wasserman's. She says, you know, nevertheless, teachers are the fulcrum of the system and their complicity is necessary for its continued function. And we might question whether or not we want it to continue to function. Though they're relatively powerless when they support the system, they can, together with students and parents with whom they are now caught in a circle of blame, endeavor to break out of that circle to change the system. So I'll leave it at that. Um, the main thing is sort of thinking about the links to the family with the school, which I think is underexplored in a lot of the literature. And of course, the links to the carceral system and a wider conception of it. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Anastasia and everybody else. And so now we have a, a half an hour left uh, for general discussion uh, and questions. So I first wanted to see if there's any kind of questions, and there are. Uh, so <clears throat> the first question is... Um, uh, from Smita. And I could read this out loud. Uh, two questions for Eric. Able to dissect this data between women and women and men's prisons. Uh, are the trends the same? I'm simply curious. A question about the political advocacy and uh, implications of your findings is a reason for the popularity of the new slavery argument because it lends itself more readily to political struggle against mass incarceration. What would be the implication of your findings that is more enforced idleness than new slavery for action political struggle? If it is social control, to what end? For Andrew, uh, so most of the people do work, uh, uh, but for the who earn wages, can we calculate the rate of education based on the profits generated by prison enterprise? Okay, so we can start with those two and there's more questions there already. Uh, er Eric, do you wanna ask questions from Smita? Sure, yeah, maybe I can I can try to address them quickly and then and then see what you think here. Um, yes, we, we are able to disaggregate the data by gender. Um, uh, we haven't yet, but, but are, are planning to. So um, I'll report back. Um, <clears throat> and then, okay, a couple of questions about the relationship between different understandings of prison labor and idleness and how that relates to social movements. Um, I think, I mean, the main thing is that the implications of the new slavery interpretation are that the, um, the sort of villains in that story are a sort of kind of smaller cadre of um, like evil CEOs and bot politicians. Whereas in understanding of the broader structural functions that prisons serve in warehousing surplus labor um, points to, it requires a more fundamental critique of the, of the neoliberal class structure. Um, so it's, I think it's, um, I, I think it's, you know, it's noble and good to advocate for rights for prison workers, um, but we shouldn't fall into the mistake of like positioning the fight against prisons or for decarceration or for abolition as exclusively a fight against the exploitation of prison labor. It, it misses what the work that prisons are actually doing um, and it'll lead us to a set of tactics that ultimately would, would fail because this sort of profit seeking through prison labor exploitation does not represent the set of forces that erected mass incarceration and sustains it. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll leave that there and, and ask you what you think. Oh, I think that was very, very good, Eric. So, uh, one more quick question about, uh, about the gender part, uh, Smita. Um, the vast majority of all prisoners are male. Uh, it's something like 93% uh, in state prisons. Uh, in, in, in the data surveyed, uh, I, you know, I'm just making this up right now, but I'm, and, and all the people working with the SBI might correct me, 
but it's something like if there's about 10,000 people surveyed uh, in those deep surveys, uh, maybe about 400 or 500 are women uh, across all the states. Uh, so um, there, there's uh, relatively few women in the survey and there's relatively few women in prison altogether. Um, uh, so yeah, that's that part. Uh, Andrew, would you like to uh, have your question? Yeah, certainly. Uh, thanks so much for the question. Uh, Gert and Eric can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that most people, most incarcerated people do work. Um, however, there is this, um, especially today, uh, there's a large number who are working just a handful of hours. Um, it's more like a kind of idleness. Um, so, but the majority of people in prison have some kind of uh, work experience. I think that if you wanted to, we're not attempting to calculate the rate of exploitation uh, in this paper. I think it's a really uh, good question and something worth pursuing. And maybe we can do that in a subsequent paper. I think if you were to do that, though, you wouldn't want to just focus on people who are earning wages. You'd want to focus on everyone who is working. Um, and to, you know, to Anastasia's point, um, you might even not just limit it to people who are tech, you know, have a work assignment, but we might think about all incarcerated people as workers. Um, we're all doing labor all the time that isn't recognized under capitalism to, you know, keep this uh, system going, um, you know, often uh, not uh, sort of on our own volition. Um, and so, but, but I think like what you would want to do is to try to get a sense of try to get some kind of estimate of what kind of profit is generated by prisons. I think that's really difficult. One thing I've thought about um, with regards to this kind of question is to, you know, I think my understanding is one thing that dominant economists uh, will do is like ask people how much they would be willing to, how much they would need to be paid in order to work certain jobs. Um, and so you could maybe do something like that and ask people you know, what, how much, you know, would you need to be paid to do the kind of work that somebody in, uh, in prison does? How much would you be, how much would you need to be paid to go to prison? Um, and then take the difference between what people are actually paid in prison for that work. And it seems to me that um, if you take the same kind of job outside of prison and compare it to the kind of job in prison, obviously you're going to need, you know, if you ask a typical person, they would, you know, expect to be paid more to do that kind of work in prison. Prisons are very dangerous places and there's all sorts of um all sorts of circumstances that uh you know make them worse places to do work than uh, outside of prisons all things being equal um so i think it's a really good question and something worth pursuing but it's not really within the scope of um our current study uh and i just uh eric could you talk a little bit more about the social control part, about the new slavery arguments, about what we were even talking about last night? Um, yeah, Geert, I mean, I, I wouldn't mind you sort of stating it right okay. now. Since okay. You, yeah. Slaver, the wrong focus. Um, uh, I think part of it is that, I, I, you know, I think what we show in this paper is most people uh, are idle and don't work. And then it has increased over uh, the period of the prison. When there's a, you know, we go from 200,000 people incarcerated to one point or so. Uh, and so that more and more percentage of people don't work. Uh, and that's, that's extremely large. And I, of course, a lot by state, as Andrew pointed out earlier. Um, and I think that the focus on prison labor or prison exploitation has all kinds of, uh, is, is, a, is a misleading lens to focus and lead to uh, uh, in the sense of um, uh, the, it, it's, it, it, uh, uh, of analysis. It's not about exploitation of prisoners. It's about um, 
the role of the prison in neoliberal capitalism. So the, the one thing, let me just one second here. It's like, if you think about uh, currently, there is a shortage uh, in the United States that people talk a lot about, right? At the same time, there's a massive amount of people uh, all the time, Michael in and out of prison, removed from the labor, from the, from the uh, years of <clears throat> neoliberal uh, uh, surplus that are removed from uh, the labor, the labor, uh, the labor pool uh, through massive amounts of disinvestment like schools and, and disinvestment in public uh, that create a whole part of the population that is marginally attached to labor, the labor force. And so prisons become a disciplining mechanism for that market attached labor force. And prison work is not about it is about the maintenance of the prison system um, uh, as a form of social control, not about uh, the exploitation, you know, of of of, uh, of, of prisoners. And if you want to add a little bit more about that, Eric. That's great. I see. I see Andy's hand is raised. Yeah, I had a question actually for Anastasia. Um, I was curious if I, you didn't talk, say much about um, just like how we might use this theory that you're developing to understand uh, schools under you know in the with COVID, like under COVID nineteen. Um, you know, like it seems to me like there were some really dramatic shifts in the education system under COVID-19. It seems like a lot of the, like some of the contradictions that you were talking about um, with, you know, schools uh, holding families accountable for uh, problems due to capitalism were kind of heightened in this situation where parents were at once expected to continue to um, you know, work, but also to make sure that their kids were able to participate in, you know, online learning. Um, and it seems to fit really nicely with uh, uh, like this, this sort of idea of surveillance that you were talking about, like literally like the school is saying, you know, bring a video camera into your home and that's part of sort of the education system now. So I was wondering if you um, have thought about this and if you'd be willing to meditate a little bit on um, on how COVID-19 fits into the theory you're developing. Yeah, absolutely. I think that it really sort of showcases um, these contradictory roles that the school has, and particularly that like the profession of teaching has, right? Because on one hand, I do think, I mean, I, I myself, you know, I consider myself a teacher, but at the higher ed level, you know, we go into it with some sort of like care ethic in our head, but the sort of actual sort of role that capital is dictating isn't that necessarily, um, or maybe even at all. And I think that's what we see with like the school reopening struggle going on. Like for example, at, in Chicago public schools, right? With the Chicago Teachers Union, um, the teachers union is taking a very subversive stance saying, we're not gonna go to work because that's literally, you know, against, you know, our, our health, our students' health, et cetera, everyone's health. Um, meanwhile, capital via the state, and if I'm, I'm going to just assert the state as collective capitalist is saying, no, back to work. Like, we'll, we'll even lock you out of your virtual classroom um, if you don't go back to work. So I think that it, it's sort of highlighting the idea that these sort of social, socially reproductive um, jobs um, in the public sector have a very contradictory role, that it's not just sort of reproducing um, you know, life or, um, you know, health or wellness or anything like that. It's producing a particular type of those things for capital and shaped by capital, not by say an actual care ethic or public health in this case um, and so on. So I, yeah, I think there's a lot to think about there. Um, I think also it sort of speaks of, yeah, the sort of relationship between the school and work, right? Because that's what's going on here is, you know, back to work, back to school, because last year when you guys were virtual schooling, you ended up organizing some very explosive protests. So um, it's time for you to go back to school. Yeah. So yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I'm going to simmer on it a little bit more. And 
Uh, Anastasia, there's also a question in the chat uh, from Smita for you. Uh, did you read it? Could you comment on that question as well? Yeah, Smita is talking about sort of the um, intersection with Foucault's work on um, uh, discipline. And I think that that's sort of right on, um, although there are going to be some theoretical differences, I think, between the way Foucault um, theorizes how discipline reconfigures. Um, so I think that that's something that I definitely need to explore and sort of map out um, how that sort of um, plays into some of the theoretical work that I'm drawing on here. But thank you so much for that. It's really important. Uh I just want to, uh, Cindy also asked a question in the, um, in the chat, and I'm happy to answer that briefly, and I can, other people can comment on it. It's about, uh, it says, that, do any of you have an unemployment, in particular the unemployment rate that includes people who are incarcerated? If not, do we have the data and tools to do so? Um, the answer would be uh, O and S. Uh, we do have the tools to do that. I don't have a particular estimate uh, right now, but it would be, I think all we have to do is add that people are removed from uh, the labor force participation rates. So all we can just add them in and then uh, gain an adjusted unemployment rate uh, in that way. Uh, I don't know if anybody else wants to add anything about that. I can just, um, so in the 80s and 90s, um, there were a bunch of people who wrote papers about that. Um, so that that work exists already. Um, so yeah, it would just need to be updated. Um, and the work just to mention is incredibly contradictory. Um, like all of the literature around the interaction between free employment and prison employment, um, even in the radical literature is like so massively contradictory because it really depends on what you look at. So even looking at this specific topic, different kinds of categorizations and stuff is going to Wheel, yield different results also. And I also just want to mention that this sort of ties into also um, like what we were all saying about idleness. Um, and especially I want to point to um, like what Anastasia was talking about, about, um, and I was going to mention this also in terms of Geert's uh, and, and Eric's presentation, which is that idleness is also a job um, in, in this like in capitalism at, at this stage, like when you're idle, you're still, um, you know, if you're using your phone, you're working for Facebook, right? Like <laughs> uh, if you're involved in work fair, like even if you're, you know, you might be sitting in an office in like social services um, and that's also working, it's working for the state. Um, so we can also think about like, like how much, like what it means to be unemployed um, at this point, and especially what it means to be idle in the prison. Um, Cause that's another, yeah, another whole part of it is like, is idleness in the prison actually a form of work, especially since it's a form of punishment. Uh, Andrew and Eric, you have a question, your hands up. Yeah, so I have a, a brief comment and then a question. So, um, well, I'll say, I really appreciate that comment um, that Hannah just made. And I think it's, um, yeah, I think it's really important. Um, I also just wanted to say one thing I noticed between Hannah and Anastasia's uh, presentations, that is something that Adana and I have been thinking about recently. Um, I don't know if I can like it's a little bit, it's gonna be a little bit inarticulate, but just like the, like thinking about like how the state reacts to uh, to struggle or to uh, kind of uh, insurrection or to um, you know to or to organizing from um, from subaltern communities or to to incarcerated incarcerated groups. Um, I think that that's something that uh, so like we like uh, Hannah mentioned that there was some evidence of like demotion in work assignments. So like work assignments uh, being a function of, um, you know, disruptive act, like activity. It's something that I really like to uh, follow up. And it's something that we're, um, we're starting to think about and would like to try to kind of um, 
think about looking for sort of uh, uh, broader trends. Um, and then, you know, the point about um, that Anastasia was talking about with uh, sort of these punitive policies that schools take on in response to um, organizing, for example, organizing around black liberation. I think that's really key. And um, one case I wanted to mention was uh, Minneapolis public schools where one of the fallouts of the murder of George Floyd was um, uh, Minneapolis public schools. I don't know if it was the entire system or just a, a select number of schools. They started to cut uh, ties with uh, police departments. So kicking police out of schools. And so that might be something to, it's an interesting kind of development maybe worth um, following just if, you have, if you're not already. Um, and then the question that I had was for Eric, and this is something that we've already talked about and we'll have to like follow up on it more, but I'm just, the thing that I'm kind of stuck on with this question of like the role or the function of prisons um, is what do you do with the absolute figures that you're working with? Um, so the slides that I've noted uh, from your presentation are 18, 20, and 23, um, where you, you know, like we see that um, even though the proportion of people in prisons um, who are working has declined over time, and even though the average number of hours among workers has declined over time, the absolute number of work hours over time has increased a lot. And so it seems to me like that should be evidence for, that should, that should like, you know, at least give cause for us to pause and ask whether or not the purpose of prisons is exploitation. Like the state is reaping more labor power from prisons today than it did in the 70s, even though you have like a larger pool of people, a larger proportion of people who aren't working in prisons. And so like I did like a, just like back of the napkin calculation on this a little while ago. And, it's, and so I see, you know, if you add up, if you just multiply like number of people who are working, their hours, um, you know, in 1974, SBI, it was like 6.4 million hours per week. In 2004, it's 21.5 million hours per week, something like that. Um, and so like, what do you, my question is like, what do you make of that? How do you square that with um, sort of the, the argument that you're making? Um, and then I guess the other kind of like a, like a additional question to that is like, it doesn't have to be like an either or thing. Like, does it have to be either, you know, uh, new slavery or forced idleness? Maybe it's something like, maybe we can ask by the definition that you have for new slavery, what percentage of people in, pr in prisons are experiencing new slavery or how often? Because it would, it would seem to me that even though like the proportion um, is, you know, the proportion of people working has declined, right? yeah. like um, it would seem to me that there would still be some slice, some segment of uh, the population incarcerated that's, that sort of fulfills that definition that you're presenting. And I think that that's, I think that that's important and maybe that's something kind of worth talking about and we can sort of offer like, Kind of a nuanced response to the to Ava DuVernay and sort of others that says, you know, yes, like there is there is like there's something like very uh, similar to slavery. There's slavery happening inside of uh, prisons. It's maybe not um, uh, it's maybe not a universal experience, and maybe it's uh, maybe it's not it's and it's certainly not the same kind of slavery that happened. Um, in the antebellum South, but you know what, um, you know, are under convict leasing, but 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 sort of how much, or sort of how how do we sort of describe it in a in a nuanced and empirical way? Eric, you want to and then ask your question for? Yeah, yeah, and I think um, I think that. Um, yeah, the question that I have for Hannah stems nicely out of this. Uh, yeah, and uh, let me try to be concise. I think, um, oh yeah, awesome, awesome questions. And yeah, Andy, I hope this is part of a you know much longer discourse. Um, or I guess that's already the case. Um, I think our main point is that 
I mean, the word exploitation is just not one that we should be using with regards to prison labor, right? Like I showed in terms of like the extraction of value, like setting value in motion to become more value. Like this, this just isn't, uh, that's not what's taking place. This isn't commodity production there. It's, it's not a profiteering market exchange. Almost all of the work that's being done is reproducing the prison, right? So our main point is that we're in a moment in capitalism where what capitalism needs is not more labor, right? It, under neoliberal capitalism, <laughs> what capitalism needs is for the state to intervene and like reproduce social stability amid skyrocketing inequality, which is highly unstable. So per, I, what we're suggesting is that prison upkeep labor doesn't offer capitalism this sort of you know, large body of highly exploitable labor. It offers capitalism a useful technique of social control to like discard surplus populations and, and like try to maintain order within the prisons, which is you know, still a challenge that corrections administrators need to contemplate uh, you know, on, a, on a daily basis. So, you know, I showed that pie chart, it's like 0.4% of all workers of prison of all prisoners are involved in actual private commodity production, right? So that's, you know, I'm not suggesting that there isn't forced labor that takes place inside prisons. It does, all prisoners experience it, right? And as you've mentioned in previous conversations, these jobs are being passed around, right? So everyone is touched by the prison labor regime. And like Asadar Bear discusses the slave fundamental class process inside prisons. So there is this like, uh, you know, there is, there's definitely some, there are several forms of continuity with slavery. Um, but I'm suggesting that the broader function that prison labor serves is, is entirely different. Right. So if we're trying to deconstruct mass incarceration, you know, we can't approach it from that from that lens. Um, and yeah, like, yeah, I think I think I think I'll leave that there. Um, and then segueing, uh, my question for Hannah is, um, and hopefully you can address in the last two minutes, is, you know, Geard and I uh, keep on coming back to this question of the extent to which prison upkeep labor is actually like necessary for uh, for departments of corrections, or if it's just the sort of, you know, fabricated set of work obligations exclusively for the purpose of social control. And there's this um, government accountability office report, right, where uh, corrections administrators were asked if you had to pay minimum wage for all this like prison upkeep labor, would you do it? And they say like, no, we would just like get rid of those jobs. And right, like I've been to so many prisons and the floors are like, you know, squeaky clean. They look like they're being mopped every like five minutes. Like they're just sort of coming up a new job. And you have this uh, gender data, which seems very interesting because they imply, you know, totally distinct prison prisons, right? There are women's prisons and men's prisons. So if there's more like affective work being done by women, it seems to suggest that there's like a different, a, to a, a different composition of labor that's being done in total in women's prisons versus in men's prisons, which might seem to suggest that like this work actually isn't like, you know, needed. It's just sort of fabric. I I'd be curious to hear you reflect on it. And I'm sorry that my question took until noon, but. Yeah, I don't know if yeah. they're gonna kick us out or if it, uh, <laughs> or if we can, as per usual, go over time to cover all the stuff we want to talk about. It, uh, yeah, it's not needed, right? And like, um, like Waquant has written about how they're like now designing prisons that don't have prison labor because prison workers are, for a variety of reasons, not efficient, including um, like we've all sort of talked about the fact that there there's class struggle that occurs inside prisons all the time um like historically it, you know the in like for-profit uh work even though it's such a small portion like literally came back into prisons with the because of the sort of like uh turn toward away from rehabilitation and towards peer punishment 
in reaction to organizing in prisons in the 60s. Um, so there is like this constant pushback um, that occurs, like prisoners are always pushing back against it. Um, and so the conclusion I come to is that, you know, really it is about social control and including the kind of work that even happens um, it's, it's, you know, it's reproductive of the prison, but it's not necessary. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I think some of your data actually suggests, in fact, that th that's becoming more true, you know, or at least the continued idleness um, suggests that that is still true. Although, and, you know, and there's also the issue that, and so, a bunch of people have written about this, um, that, like truly idle prisoners are actually less likely to um, push back against prison systems um, because of the fact that they, well, first of all, they, they don't, they have less contact with other prisoners um, and they, you know, they are engaged in activities that are not politicized in the same way, um, especially since they're now, you know, can't read in prison anymore, like these politicized activities are being taken away. Um, so I think that it has this sort of contradictory role, right, where it's a mode of social control, but it's also a dangerous one in the way that work is all together, right? Like work is dangerous, like in the same way that reproductive work is dangerous to capital because it reproduces people who could revolt and work is dangerous to capital because it's a place where people can organize and that work has expanded into these whole new aspects of our lives and the, the same thing is true in the prison um, where work is both a mode of social control and it's also a dangerous place which is like when stage was talking about anastasia sorry when anastasia <laughs> going into nicknames now um when anastasia was talking about this being like a fulcrum like this is why i think prison work is really important to look at even though it's this like small portion because it's um this place like you know sorry i'm talking so much about this but like uh ruth, ruth wilson gilmore talks about like the margins as being um like the edges are uh the the margins are also edges like they're places where things meet so they're places where th things can really change so prison work like prisons are already on the work or uh on the margins and then the reproductive work in the prison is you know, dominant in the prison, but like marginalized on marginalized overall. Um, so is a place where you can see these like real like tectonic shifts. Um, so yes, yeah, so simultaneously, it's social control and also it's incredibly dangerous. That was a long winded response, sorry, and complicated. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, everybody. So I wish we could go talk about this more somewhere now. Um, but uh, maybe next year in New Orleans. Uh, so, um, you know, or if not before. Uh, so anyway, um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming and then enjoy the next sessions. And uh, thank you all the people for giving really interesting papers. And so we'll see you all everyone. soon. Thanks so much. Take care.